Welcome. This video is going to start chapter 11, which is on sequences and series. And we're going to begin this with 11.1, .1, which is on sequences. Now, even though only the first section of this chapter is going to deal with sequences directly, um, we need to understand what a sequence is in order to understand what a series is because a series is a special type of sequence when you dig down to the nitty gritty. So let's start with a definition. A sequence is an ordered infinite list of numbers. Okay, so it looks something like this. We've got, this is usually the notation we used, A1, A2, A3, eventually you reach the nth one and it just goes on and on forever. The notation that we use We sometimes write this or we write this. Okay, so it's just an ordered infinite list of numbers. If there's a formula For the nth term a n, we can write the sequence as a n. Not all sequences have a nice formula, okay? It's just a list of numbers, but if there is a formula, then we use it. So let's talk about some common sequences that come up. The two common sequences that we're going to talk about are called arithmetic and geometric. So let's talk about the first type. An arithmetic sequence is a sequence in which a common difference, D, is added to each a n minus 1 to get a n. What do we mean by this? It means that if we subtract a n minus a n minus 1, you get d. And this is true for all n. OK? So as an example, if I were to list the numbers like, uh, let's say, 7, uh, 12, 17, 22, and so on, if we continue in this pattern, we notice that we are adding 5 each time. So this is an arithmetic sequence, and d is equal to 5. This is arithmetic. Likewise, you could take any two terms and subtract them, 
and you will get five. And this is what we mean by difference, right? If you take any term and you subtract the term before, you get the number five. So what is the formula for an arithmetic sequence? Well, think about it. You can always get to the nth term by doing what? Well, let's say we wanted um, the hundredth term. What we would do is we would take the first term and then we would add to it d uh, 99 times. If we wanted the hundredth term, we would add d 99 times. So the trick is whatever term we want, we add to it n minus 1 times d. Okay, so this would be the formula for the nth term. Okay. Now let's do the next, this is for arithmetic sequences, okay? So let's do the next type. A geometric sequence. is a sequence in which a common ratio is multiplied by every term to give you the next term. So the reason they call it a ratio is because if you take any number and you divide it by the term before, you get the same number. We're going to call that R. This is the R for ratio. Okay. So another way of writing this is that a n is the same as r times a n minus 1. So what would a formula be for a geometric sequence? Well, the way you get the nth term is by taking the first term and then multiplying it by r n minus 1 times. So it looks like this. a1 times r to the n minus 1. Okay, so let's do some examples. So problem 1. Find a formula for the general term a n of the sequence. So part A, let's look at this sequence, negative 2, 5, 12, 19. So what do we notice about this sequence? Well, if you look closely at it, it looks like we are adding we're adding 7 each time, right? That seems to be the pattern here. So we can say that this is arithmetic where a1 is equal to negative 2. That's the first term. And the D, the number that we keep adding, is 7. So the formula, remember, you take the first term and you add N minus 1 times D. So there you go. If we want to write this a little bit nicer, let's distribute. So it becomes 7N minus 9. 
this is our formula. So if we wanted to write it as a n notation, this is how we would write the sequence. And you could check this, right? If you plug in 1 into the formula, you get negative 2. If you plug in 2 into the formula, you get 5, and so on. You could see that this will generate the sequence. Let's do another one. Remember, we're finding a formula for this sequence. We start at negative 2 and we go to 10, negative 50, 250, and so on. Now if you look closely at this, we are not adding something to each term, right? We're definitely not adding. Okay, but we notice that we are multiplying, right? We are multiplying by negative 5. Each time we're multiplying by negative 5. That's why the sign keeps changing also. So this means we're dealing with a geometric sequence and the first term is negative 2 and the ratio is negative 5, right? If you take any number and you divide it by the one before, you get negative 5. So we're ready to write down the formula. Remember you take the first term and you're going to multiply that by r to the n minus 1. And you can't really simplify this, so this is how we leave the answer. So the answer is like this. And if you plug in n equals 1, you could see that we get negative 2. If you plug in n equals 2, we actually get 10 and so on. So we see that the sequence does get generated. Let's do another example. This one is going to be um, a little trickier. So we have 7 over 11, 14 over 14, 28 over 17, 56 over 20, 112 over 23. Now, this is a little tricky because we notice that we are not actually adding or dividing a number, or sorry, adding or multiplying a number by a common number. In other words, this is not geometric or arithmetic. So how can we find a formula for this? Well, let's look carefully at the numerator and denominator individually, because if you look at the numerators only first, Notice that to get from 7 to 14, we are multiplying by 2. And then to get from 14 to 28, we're multiplying by 2. And that pattern actually continues. In other words, the numerator is geometric. So with that being said, the first term is equal to 7, and the ratio is equal to positive 2, and so the numerator looks like this. 7 times 2 to the n minus 1, right? This is a n. Now, what about the denominator? So if we look at the denominator, the denominator is actually going up by adding 3 each time. So we notice that this is, the denominator is arithmetic. So let's call it B. B1 is 11, 
and the difference is 3. So Bn is equal to uh, first term, so it's 11 plus n minus 1 times 3, which is the same as 11 plus 3n minus 3, which is 3n plus 8. So we're ready to write the sequence down. You need to put the numerator divided by the denominator, so it looks like this. So this is how we would write the answer. This is just this just goes to show that it doesn't have to be that the entire thing follows a pattern, but if the individual pieces follow a pattern, then we can still find a formula for it. And we can check this, right? If you plug in 1 into this formula, you will actually get 7 over 11, which matches what's above. If you plug 2 into the formula, we get 7 times 2, which is 14 on top, and 6 plus 8 is 14 on the bottom, so that works as well, and so on. So we can see that this pattern will work. Now, I want to make a point here that not all sequences have patterns. So, note. We can define a sequence abstractly Sorry, that looks a little messy. Let me write that a little bit better. Okay, we can define a sequence abstractly so that it has no pattern. but it is still defined. In other words, it's still a definition, it just doesn't have a nice formula or pattern. So what's an example? So some examples are, we could, for example, have a sequence where EN is equal to the number of students enrolled at LBCC during fall 1-year-of-the-school's-history-okay-so-this-is-an-example-of-a-sequence-we-can-certainly-list-the-numbers-like-this-right-um-this-is-an-example-let's-do-another-example-what-if-we-let-p-n is equal to the nth decimal place of pi. In other words, p1 is equal to 1, p2 is equal to 4, p3 is equal to 1, and so on right because it's 3.14159 it goes on and on and on forever and ever and there is no pattern right we hopefully you guys know enough about uh, pi to know that the numbers never have a pattern which is why people are fascinated with it or another example we can define a sequence recursively two now recursively just means that I tell you how to get to a term from the term before so here's how you can do it 
Let's call this guy Fn. F1 is 1, F2 is also 1, and then any Fn after that can be obtained by taking the two terms before and adding them together. So what this means is 1, 1, the way we get to the next one is adding those two together, you get 2, then you add 1 plus 2, you get 3, then you add 2 plus 3, you get 5, then you add 3 plus 5, you get 8, and so on. You may recognize this. This is actually called, this is called the Fibonacci sequence. This is an extremely famous sequence. Um, it's used to describe certain flowers and things. Um, it's used to describe them in sort of a recursive way and why some of these patterns exist. So the Fibonacci sequence, you can actually Google it on Wikipedia and you can see that there is a lot of stuff about it out there. Okay, but the point is, it's a well-defined sequence. You can generate numbers forever this way, but we don't have a formula that we're going to write down right now for it. Okay, so what is another way that we can think of a sequence? We can think of a sequence as a function whose domain is the set of natural numbers. So what does this mean? So let's say that we have a list of numbers and it goes on and on like this. Then we can actually think of it this way. This actually corresponds to points. And they look like this. The first point is 1, A1. The second point is 2, A2. And then 3, A3, and so on. Or if we want to think of it as a function, you can. This just means that f of 1 is A1. f of 2 is A2. And you just continue this pattern. This is called a discrete function. Why discrete? Because it is not continuous. These are not, this is not a smooth curve. These are just a bunch of dots, right? For example, f of uh, one and a half or any sort of decimal you can think of doesn't exist here. You can only plug in natural numbers, right? The domain is the set of natural numbers. Okay. So we are going to get into some examples and some visuals here, but we need to come up with a definition first. Okay. Or actually, you know what, let me go ahead and help you visualize this. So if we were to draw a graph of a sequence, This is an example of some dots. And right, you've got a bunch of dots and they go to the right forever, right? Because it's an infinite list. So you've got to be able to go to the right forever. So you can draw a picture of this. So every single sequence has a way that we can visualize it as a bunch of dots. You'll notice too that there is nothing to the left, nothing over here, totally empty, okay? Because we are only moving to the right. So there's no negative numbers and there's nothing in between these 
you only get stuff directly above or below these. You could, by the way, if we were to go on, it's possible to get, you know, a dot down here. Or you could even, if we go on, we could get a dot right at zero. This would be five a5 and this would be 6a6. The point is any real number is allowed so you don't necessarily have to need it to be a positive number. You can get negatives, you can get zero, you can get whatever. Okay but they have to be real numbers. In this case notice that a6 is zero right so let's just write that down. Okay, so now that we know what a sequence is and how to visualize it, um, what makes this calculus is we can now talk about what it means to have a limit of a sequence. So this will be our next definition. A sequence, AN, has a limit L if we can make the terms a n as close as we want to L by taking N sufficiently large. Now how do we write that something has a limit? So here is the notation. This is the notation. Okay, so you write, this should look familiar. This should look familiar. Uh, compare this to the following. This is the equivalent of what you learned with a function, right? So this is pretty much the same thing. The only difference is that this is a curve and these are dots, okay? But the point, the fact that these approach L is actually, um, is actually the same thing. So if I were to draw a picture of this, so let me do this on the next page just to give you an idea, okay? And I wanna show you the difference. Let's say this is L right here. Let's say we have some function, and then as we go to the right forever, we approach that dotted line, right? This is an example of the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals l, right? This is something that you learned in uh, single variable calculus, right? This is, you literally learned this in chapter 2, right? This is back in chapter 2 when you first learned what a limit was. So now, what does it mean for the limit as n goes to infinity of a n to be l? Well, here's what it means. It means that, let me draw a bunch of So it means that the dots that we get from this sequence actually approach that dotted line closer and closer and closer. They never reach just like the curve never reaches. I mean, it might reach, but the point is that um, as we go to the right, it actually does get closer and closer. Let me make that picture a little bit better. Um, maybe this is a better picture. We should kind of draw it getting closer and closer as we go. I don't want to draw it too 
so that it's touching it. But the point is, um, this is what we're learning now. So this is for sequences. I'm hoping that you see the difference here, okay? But they are the same idea, right? Either way, we are approaching some number L. Okay, so what is the language that we use? If this guy is equal to L and L is finite. We call a n a convergent sequence. And we say that a n converges to L. Okay, so this is what it means for a sequence to converge to a number. Okay, it just means that this limit exists. Now, on the flip side, if the limit as n goes to infinity of a n does not exist, we call a n a divergent sequence. What does a divergent sequence look like? Oh, maybe, um, you know, the dots are all over the place, kind of like pi, and they never approach anything, right? Or maybe the dots just get bigger and bigger forever. Um, in this case, we would write DNE. In this case, sometimes we say this. But just, I'm going to put a little asterisk by this. Even though you can write equals infinity and this is valid, recall that this still means that it diverges, okay? It only converges if it equals, um, if the limit goes to a finite real number. But saying that it's equal to infinity just means that it grows larger and larger. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, do an example here. Um, let me see. I believe we are on example two, right? Does the sequence converge or diverge and the sequence is n over n plus 1. So let's go ahead and write out some terms here. So if we plug in 1, we actually get a half. And if we plug in 2, we get 2 thirds. If we plug in three, we get three fourths. So we could do this all day, right? We could see the pattern. Do these numbers seem to be getting closer and closer to something? Well, the longer we go, the more we realize that um, this is actually getting closer and closer to one, isn't it? And if we were to look at this picture, let's say there's one. Um, when you look at one, we're at a half. When we look at two, we're at two thirds. When we look at three, we're at three quarters. 
And when we look at four, we're at four fifths. And we can see that we are getting closer and closer. And it makes sense, right? Like if you go down to say the hundredth number, we would end up with 100 over 101, which is like right below. So this is getting closer and closer to one. So we would say the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n plus one is equal to one, okay? Or another way to say this is that n over n plus one converges to one. Okay, we want to get comfortable with both of these notations. Now, you may wonder how these things are related to one another, the old idea and the new idea, right? So question, we have a lot of techniques of finding limits for functions. So how are this limit and this limit related if f of n is equal to a n. Now what do I mean by f of n is equal to a n? This means that what if the function and the regular, um, what if the function and the sequence actually have the same terms? You only have an n instead of an x. Okay, well, this means that if the function f of x is a curve, then a n would be dots along the curve. So if one converges, does the other converge? So if one limit exists, does the other limit exist? Well, it turns out that this is the case in one direction, but not necessarily the other. So this is a theorem. It says the following. Suppose a n is a sequence and f of x is a function such that f of n equals a n for all n. Then if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is equal to L, then the limit as n goes to infinity of a n equals L also. Okay, so if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x exists, then the other limit must exist also, and they equal the same thing. This is important, and it's only true in one direction. Okay, um, let's talk about some facts or some properties of sequence limits. So I want us to start by supposing, so suppose that, let me write it this way. Suppose that the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is equal to a, and 
the limit as n goes to infinity of bn is equal to b. And let's take c to be any real number constant. So what are some, we can call these the limit laws. So first, the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus b n is equal to. So the limit of a sum we can imagine is just going to be the sum of the limits. In other words, this is just going to be a plus b. This is always true. What about minus? Yes, same thing. So if that's a minus, then that just becomes a minus. So just like with functions. Next, what about the limit as n goes to infinity of a constant times a n? So just like constants times functions, we can pull constants out of the limit. Same thing is true here. In other words, this is just equal to c times a. Next, what about the limit as n goes to infinity of a n times b n? This is just going to equal a times b. Next, what about the limit as n goes to infinity of a constant? Constant just means that the dots are going horizontally and not moving up and down. In other words, the limit would just be the constant. Let me do some more over here. How about the limit as n goes to infinity of a n over b n? Yes, this is equal to a over b provided b is not zero. Okay, if the bottom term goes to zero, then we do have uh, some potential issues that we will talk about. Finally, limit as n goes to infinity of a n to the p. You can probably guess what's going to happen here. Just a to the p. Okay. Let's do, um, oh, let me do one more theorem here, and then we will um, go on to do some examples and finding some of these limits, okay? So um, a nice theorem that we have, I want to do this on the next page so I can uh, visualize this with a picture or draw a picture for you guys. So theorem, if the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n is equal to zero, then Without the absolute value, the sequence also converges to zero. Okay, what this is saying is, let's say that you have a bunch of dots and they're getting closer and closer to zero, their absolute value. So maybe you have something like this. We're saying that if we look at the absolute value of these things, um, the absolute value is going to take all the negatives and flip them over to the other side. And you notice that these have to go to zero also. If you just look at these dots, the absolute value has to go to zero as well. So if the absolute value goes to zero, then the function must go to zero too because it means the dots are getting closer and closer to zero. Note this only works with zero. In general, absolute values do not converge to the same thing as functions. Um, they do if everything's positive, but if you have some negatives, some things might go haywire. Okay. 
All right, so let's do some examples. So this will be number three. Is a n equal to n over the square root of 10 plus n convergent or divergent? So let's list some terms, okay? If you plug in n equals 1 here, you get 1 over the square root of 11. If you plug in n equals 2, you get 2 over the square root of 12. And then the next one would be 3 over the square root of 13. Now if you continue on in this pattern, we notice something, okay? The top is actually growing faster than the bottom. Okay, um, this is actually increasing, right? The bottom is a square root and the top is not a square root and they're each going up by one each time. So this actually is growing higher and higher as we move to the right, okay? Um, so this is actually divergent. Okay, it increases without bound. In fact, what's another way that we could do this? Okay, um, let, me, let me give you guys a little bit more of intuition. So I wanna give you guys a useful fact. So let me write this on the next page. Um, so useful facts, okay, um, okay, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is always 0, okay, why? Because you're dividing a number by um, you're dividing a number by a bigger and bigger number, right? So this goes to 0. And in fact, we can even extend this. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n to the k is equal to 0, where k is any positive real number. Okay, so k um, being greater than 0. Um, well, let me just write it that way. k greater than 0. So for all k greater than 0. So what's another way that we could do number three? So let's do number three, and this time in more detail. We can do similar tricks in calculus, or sorry, from calculus one. If we wanted to do the limit as n goes to infinity of n over the square root of 10 plus n, if you just plug in infinity, you get infinity over infinity. So a trick that we have of dealing with this is we can divide top and bottom by the square root of n. If we do that, we get the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n to the 1 half over, down here we get, um, 10 over n plus 1. And by this property that I have here, or specifically this one, this guy goes to 0 and this guy goes to 0. And we know we can do the limit of each term individually based on this limit properties that I have here, right? These limit properties allow us to take the limit of each piece. Okay? So what happens? Actually, sorry, I made a mistake here. I apologize. If you divide the top by um, n to the 1 half, you actually get, I shouldn't have written 1 over. It's not 1 over, right? This is what you get. My apologies.
sorry, the numerator was wrong before, right? So this guy goes to zero. However, this guy grows forever. So it's almost like we have infinity over one, right? Which is equal to infinity. So this limit is infinity. In other words, it diverges. Sorry about that. Okay, um, let's do another one. Let's find the limit as n goes to infinity of ln of n over n. Now notice if you try plugging infinity in, you do get infinity over infinity, which is no good, right? So what is the trick here? You might remember L'Hopital's rule. We could still use L'Hopital's rule as long as we are using the theorem and we're talking about a function instead. So let's let f of x equal ln of x over x, right? You notice that these look exactly the same. The only difference is this guy is continuous and the top guy on top are just a bunch of dots, right? Now that we have a continuous function, let me write this, that this is continuous on its domain. It's not just continuous, but it's also differentiable. And the whole point of why we're doing this is so that we can take a derivative, right? So what would be the limit as x goes to infinity of the ln of x over x? Well, we know we can use L'Hopital's rule because we do get infinity over infinity. So this has to equal the limit as x goes to infinity of, if you take the derivative of the top, you get 1 over x. If you take the derivative of the bottom, you get 1. In other words, this is the same as the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x, which is 0. So by the theorem, which theorem am I talking about? If I go back here, Ah, here we go. So if I go back here to this theorem, remember we said that if a function goes to a number, then the corresponding sequence also goes to that same number. So coming back here, so by the theorem, limit as n goes to infinity of ln of n over n equals zero also. Or another way to write this is that ln of n over n, that sequence converges to zero. Okay, so we can write it this way, or we can write it this way. They mean the same thing. Okay. Uh, let's do a few more. Let's look at the following sequence. So is this sequence convergent or divergent? We have negative 1 to the n. What does this sequence look like? Well, if we were to list these numbers out, if you plug in 1 first, it's negative 1. Then if you plug in 2, negative 1 squared is 1. Then if you plug in 3, negative 1 cubed is negative 1. This is just alternating between negative 1 and 1. Does this approach anything? Well, what does this guy look like? So if this is 1 and this is negative 1, we literally have a sequence that's doing this. The dots are bouncing back and forth. It's not getting closer and closer to anything, right? So. It's a divergent. So uh, let me write it this way. It's 
it diverges, right? The dots oscillate back and forth and it does not approach anything. Okay, let's do another example. Does negative 1 to the n over n converge or diverge? Well, if we plug in 1, we get negative 1. If we plug in 2, we get 1 half. If we plug in 3, we get negative 1 third. If we plug in 4, we get a fourth. And we can see the pattern, but it's going to be a little hard to study this because it is bouncing back and forth. So the trick is, let's look instead at the absolute value of our sequence. What does the absolute value of the sequence do? Well, the ends are all positive already, but what it does is it kills off the top oscillation, and so you just get 1 over n. Okay? Right? Because the absolute value of 1 or negative 1 is just always 1. What is the limit as n goes to infinity, then, of the absolute value of a n? This is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, which is 0. So, what does the theorem say? Let's look back at the theorem. Remember, the theorem says that if the absolute value goes to 0, then that means the sequence goes to 0 also. And that is exactly what we have here, right? If we look at the problem we, we're working on, we said that the absolute value does equal 0, or it converges to 0. So by the theorem, this limit or this sequence also converges to 0. Okay, we've got a little bit more to go on this video. Um, I do want to talk about some theorems that are true. So let's talk about the squeeze theorem. The squeeze theorem that you learned with functions is still true for sequences. So let me just write it that this is the squeeze theorem for sequences. Let's suppose that you have um, one sequence that's between two other guys. And let's suppose that the limit as n goes to infinity of a n goes to l and the limit as n goes to infinity of cn is also l, where l is finite. So what are we saying? We're saying that a n goes to l and cn goes to l. Then this implies that b n goes to L also. Okay, this is called the squeeze theorem. This is extremely useful when you can find two simple things. What do I mean? So this is useful with the following scenario. So let's suppose that um, you have a complicated sequence. In other words, it's hard to see what it's doing, but you can find 
something simple on the left and something simple on the right, or I should say something simple that's below and something simple that's above. And by simple, I mean you can find the, I mean you can find the actual limit. And let's suppose that these two go to the same number. If these two both approach L, then this means that you can conclude that this bottom guy also converges to L. Okay. Um, which is really nice because otherwise we would have no way of knowing what the complicated sequence does. So let's do an example of using the squeeze theorem. Um, this is number seven. Does the sequence n factorial over n to the n converge or diverge. Okay. So let me give you guys a reminder in case you forgot what a factorial is. So um, the definition of factorial Well, um, 5 factorial, for example, is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 120. Or 4 factorial is just 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 24. And so on, right? Um, what would 2 factorial be? It's just 2 times 1, which is 2. 1 factorial is just 1. Uh, also, something to note is that 0 factorial is also 1. We're going to see a lot more of the factorial later. Okay, so we would like to know what this sequence above does, which you could see it's quite complicated. Okay, let's write out some terms just to get an idea of what this sequence looks like. If we plug in a 1, we get 1 factorial over 1 to the 1, which is 1. If we plug in uh, 2, we get 2 factorial, which is 2, over 2 squared, which is 4. If we plug in a 3, the top is 6, and the bottom is 3 cubed, which is 27. If we plug in 4, the top we get 24, the bottom we get 4 to the 4th power, which is 256. We notice that they seem to be getting smaller and smaller, but how can we show that this goes um, to zero? As it looks like it goes to zero, how can we show this? And note, we cannot use the trick from before because there is no such thing as x factorial as a function, right? This guy up here does not make sense, right? So this doesn't. make sense okay because um, what is a uh, three and a half factorial for example factorial is, has to be a whole number when you plug it in right so you can't even you can't even connect the dots in a smooth way so here is the trick the trick is to use the squeeze theorem and we need to find something smaller and bigger that's a lot more simple to study so Let's go ahead and take our guy, n factorial over n to the n, and we are going to write it this way. n factorial would be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and we go all the way down to 1. What's n to the n? n to the n is n times n times n, and we have exactly n of these, right? Now the trick, the trick here, well, let's go ahead and cancel the n over n, right? Because those match. 
So the trick is that there is a correspond there is a correspondence here, right? We have an n minus one over n. We have an n minus two over n, and all of these we can keep going in this pattern, and we have this. So what can we say about each of these things that we circled? Each of these things that we circled has an n on the bottom, and that's larger than the term on top, right? In other words, all of these are, are smaller than 1. So I could say that this entire complicated thing is smaller than what? Than this guy, because all of these guys are smaller than 1, and 1 times anything is itself which means that this is all smaller than 1 over n. So let me write that here, 1 over n. Okay. Now, why did I put an equal? Because in the case of n equals 1, we actually only have the first term that I canceled out. So we need to allow equality. Otherwise, it's always going to be a strict less than. Regardless, this is what we have. And what about something simple that's underneath? Well, we're going to actually choose something very simple. Certainly, we always get a positive, right? Because the numerator and denominator are both positive. So this is what we mean by finding a simple thing on both sides. What do these limits go to? Well, the limit as n goes to infinity of 0 is 0, and the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is also 0, right? In other words, the guy below goes to 0, and the guy above also goes to 0. So by the squeeze theorem, n factorial over n to the n converges to 0. Okay, Tricky problem. Squeeze theorem problems are never easy, but um, it is important to understand this technique. Okay. There is um, one last uh, thing uh, or series of things that we need to go over. This will only take a few minutes, but we do need to go over it in this section. So, a couple of definitions that we need. We need to know what it means for a sequence to be increasing and decreasing. A sequence an is called increasing. If a n is less than a n plus 1 for all n greater than or equal to 1. So in other words, if the terms are getting bigger and bigger, it is called decreasing if a n is bigger than a n plus 1 for all n greater than or equal to 1. That's just the inequality flipped the other way. In other words, the terms are getting smaller and smaller. Okay. Finally, it is called, we have a word that's called monotonic if it is either increasing or decreasing. We're not going to use this word um, pretty much ever in this class, because usually I will just say that if it's increasing or it's decreasing. But um, there are some theorems that we're going to use that uh, rely on this word monotonic. Okay. Um, note that I want to say to show 
a sequence is increasing or decreasing, there are two ways. One, show the inequality directly. What do I mean by that? So this inequality right here, or this one, you could see if you could show it directly. Um, this works sometimes, but not all the time. So I'll just say it works sometimes. The reason is sometimes it's too hard to determine what the inequality does. Um, this way works all the time. However, it is more complicated to use sometimes. Um, you can just let f of x be a function such that f of n equals a n and use derivatives. or use um, f prime of x. Remember guys, if a derivative is always positive, then this means f is increasing, which actually means that a n is also increasing, right? The curve goes up, the dots go up also. And you could do the same thing with, uh, with decreasing as well. This way always works, but it is harder to do. So that's why I say um, we save it unless we really need it, okay? All right, so um, I'm gonna do just a couple more examples because this is going to be useful for later in the class when we're actually needing to show that something is increasing or decreasing for a theorem to be true. I should say later in this chapter. So number eight, show that the sequence four over n plus two is decreasing. So how do we show it's decreasing? Remember, we have to show that a n is bigger than a n plus one. So what's a n? a n is 4 over n plus 2. And what's a n plus 1? This just means that we substitute n plus 1 for we plug an n plus 1 in for n there. And so a n plus 1 is actually going to be 4 over n plus 1 plus 2, which is 4 over n plus 3. Can we compare these two things directly? We sure can. What can you say about 4 over n plus 2 and 4 over n plus 3? Well, I hope you can clearly see that the denominator on the right must be bigger than the denominator on the left, but the numerators are the same. So then which is bigger? The one with the smaller denominator is bigger, okay? This means that this is true, okay? But this is a n, so this means that a n is bigger than a n plus one. Okay, what did we just show? This is true for all n, so this implies that the sequence is decreasing. Sometimes we get lucky, and we can only use this type of reasoning if the numerator and denominators, um, so let me just say that they have the same numerator, but the denominator on the right is larger. You can only use a trick like this if 
the numerator or denominator is constant and it's easy to see which one is bigger, but that is not always true. So this will be our last example. Show that this guy is decreasing. Okay, so let's go ahead and write down a n. a n, of course, is n over n squared plus 1. What would a n plus 1 be? We're just going to replace an n plus 1 wherever you see an n. So it's there, and we also have an n plus 1 squared plus 1. So what do we notice? We notice that the denominator is larger on the right, but unfortunately the numerator is larger on the right also. So it is not clear how to compare these two. It is not clear which one is bigger, right? I know it's tempting to say, well, um, the guy on the left has to be bigger because the bottom is growing faster um, because it's squared. However, um, you need to be careful when you say something like this um, because this is really a derivative argument. And so this is why we need to use derivatives to argue this. So here is how you do it. We're going to say let f of x equals x over x squared plus 1. We're going to take a derivative. So what is f prime of x? We're going to use the quotient rule to do this. It's going to be the derivative of the top times the bottom. Sorry, times the bottom, not the derivative of the bottom. So minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. What do we get on top? We get x squared plus 1 minus 2x squared. That is 1 minus x squared over x squared plus 1 squared, which is, I can factor the top. So this is my derivative. So um, if you recall from calculus one, figuring out where a function is increasing and decreasing recalls um, using critical numbers and using the first derivative to figure this out, creating a sign table. What are the critical numbers here? Well, x equals one and x equals negative one. So if we look at this guy, here's negative one, here's one. All I really care about is what it's doing over here. Now let me make, let me actually put this on the next page. So we know that f prime of x is equal to 1 minus x times 1 plus x. And the bottom was x squared plus 1 squared. And we've got our critical numbers, negative 1 and positive 1. I'm going to plug in something right here. How about we plug in 2? What's f prime of 2 equal to? We get negative 1 times 3 over 5 squared. It's clearly a negative number, which means that our function is decreasing over here. All we really care about is what's happening to the right, okay? Because sequences take place entirely in the positive numbers, don't they? So this implies that f is increasing on 1 to infinity. What does this mean? This means that a n is also, sorry, not increasing. I don't know why I wrote that. Let me erase this. Not increasing, I meant decreasing, right? It's negative. Decreasing. 
So this implies that an is decreasing on, or I don't have to say on anything um, because remember a sequence is always going to the right forever. Okay, so an is decreasing. So whenever you want to show that a sequence is increasing or decreasing, you can try with inequalities, but if it's not obvious, then we need to use derivatives to do it. Okay, that concludes the video. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.